Better quality scans. OK. And what else? Negatives. Digitizing negatives. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something that the gadget isn't designed to do, which is always cool. Digitizing slides. Piece of cake. Anything else? Bueller? You know, it's always a sad day when you have to kick them out of the nest and... Okay. So, I'm going to put up here, and what I want you to do is to take a picture of it, a um, URL in which everything I'm going to talk about how to do, I've already done for you, and you can download it and not have to do it. It's not ready yet. And Wednesday, there will be a URL that will take you to a video that will show you in absolutely painfully granular detail how to do all of this, okay? Because as I was setting up today, I realized that what I have is this much space to do all the things I need to do, which is about, I need about this much space to do it. So, fair enough? Okay, because I've already cooked off this stuff. Um, the D850 is the most amazing camera I have ever shot with, period. And the ES2 film digitizer, which I'll have to say a bunch of times, is one of the coolest little gadgets there is. But what I'm going to show you how to do is how to use the ES2 film digitizer on every camera from the 5000 all the way through the D5 up to the 850. Well, who cares about any other camera, ma'am? Is there not, are there other cameras other than Nikon? I didn't know there was something else other than Nikon. This is not known to my people. I'm a Nikon ambassador. I come from Nikonia. And when I became an ambassador, I was granted photographic immunity. And by the power invested in me, for as long as you're in this room, I grant you all photographic immunity. Leave the door, you take crappy pictures again. Um, all right, so let me show you what the argument is for this. What you're looking at, this is a calibrated monitor. This is not. This is a BenQ SW320, which if, and when I'm asked, that's the monitor to get. I absconded with the one upstairs. The reason why I'm running two monitors is I need you to be able to see what the image actually looks like. By putting it on here, it's going to be too contrasty, too bright, and the colors will be off. And so what I've found when I do these types of presentations is that people go, well, that, looks like, that looks bad, but it looks great over here, and then I have to flip the monitor around. So I want you to pay it. This is the monitor to pay attention to. This is calibrated. It's 98% of Adobe RGB, and it's 4K. OK, so here's what the problem is for me to put this in perspective. I shot over 6,000 rolls of film a year for 21 years, not including uh, chromes, not including 4, 5, and 8, 10. So just black and white film, 6,000 rolls of film a year. If we multiply that times 21, that's 126,000 rolls of film. If you multiply that by 36, that's 4,536,000 frames. That's a lot of negative. And I spent $200 a month to store all my negatives, which means that I spent $24,000 a year. If we look at 24 years of storing, storing this stuff, that's $57,000. Trust me when I tell you, I can't wait to pay my assistant to sit there and digitize negatives because it will be nice to recover all of that and have it all stored on a couple of hard drives. So that's the promise of this, okay? Not that I'm going to digitize all, all of them, but I'll be able to digitize all the ones that I want. Now, when you shoot a slide on this system, it makes it into a raw file, but there is a negative mode in here that turns it into a JPEG. So I said, well, I'd, ra I'd like to have them all be raw files, right? So how many people have heard of something called picture control? Okay. 
How many people have heard that picture control is for JPEGs? Whoever told you that is ill-informed. Picture control utility, which is the same as image styles and Canon, and I don't know what it is in the other ones, but what picture control utility is, is a setup in which you can normalize cameras across the board. So if you own six different cameras, you can make them all respond visually the same. So it's designed based on the way in which the sensor works to enhance qualities of the way in which the raw file is demosaic. And what demosaicing means is it means that it takes it from the linearized black and white file and mixes it into color. And so you can make it so that if, let's say you're shooting a wedding and you have six different shooters and they have six different cameras, you can make it across the board so that all the cameras appear to be the same. That's helpful. Okay, picture control was developed for raw files. It is not JPEG only. The only reason why it becomes JPEG only is if you use a third party raw processor. And what a third party raw processor is, is a raw processor in which is not made by the camera manufacturer. I simply ask you this. Who knows how the raw file is better mixed? The person that invented it or a company that's looking at it after the fact? Okay. Asking the artist what they were thinking or having a bunch of guys sitting around a table telling you what it was they thought? It's the same sort of conversation. I appreciate that UIs, user interfaces, are across the board difficult in raw processors, but that doesn't change the fact that the best possible file that you can attain will be from the manufacturer's raw processor, no matter who makes the camera. Sir? So what does Nikon use for its raw processor? Nikon's algorithm. It uses Nikon's software that it wrote, that it invented. What's the name of Capture NXD. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind is that there's basically six things that a raw processor does, and that's it. Anything else is on attenuated, am I on your, am I good? Okay, anything else is in attenuated data. And a raw file, for lack of a better description, is a TIFF with an instruction set that allows you to remix the file. A TIFF is basically a raw file without that instruction set. So when you open up the file, it says, what about this? And what you can do is rebake aspects of the cake and remix the data state that is basically TIFF. Keeping that in mind, you're working on a TIFF. Fair enough. Now, how many people bake? How much do you handle? Pie crust. As little as possible. Raw files are pie crust. Okay? All artifacting is, if you get one thing from me, this should be the one thing I hope that you take home to think about. All artifacting is cumulative and maybe multiplicative. And the problem with doing heavy lifting at the raw level, other than opening it up, getting the white balance set, setting the um, color space correctly, and opening up maybe a little. Um, anything after that, you introduce artifact. And the type of artifact you introduce will most likely be multiplicative. So it could be a 2% quality decrease at the bottom, but when you're done, it's a 300% quality decrease at the top. OK? And if I have time, I'll show you what multiplication artifacting looks like. Sir? But raw file processing is Do you know what non-destructive means? So anytime I do anything to data, I do what? And when I process it, I do what? And when I alter it, I do what? Which does what? Introduces artifact because I clipped the data. All non-destructive means is that I can go back to the beginning and go, here's the raw file. Right, anytime you do, and it's the biggest one of the biggest misconceptions, anytime you do anything to a file that isn't what it is that you're looking at after you've opened it up, you have clipped data. Anytime you clip data, you introduce artifact. Anytime you introduce artifact, you introduce the possibilities of multiplication and accumulation. The goal is its pie crust. And you handle pie crust how much? Very little. Want a secret to pie crust? Don't use water, use vodka and put it in the pie crust. 
Yeah, seriously, vodka. Because what happens is it evaporates out and it makes the pie crust flakier. <laughs> my brother, that, he's, he's into making pies. My brother's a biker. So you have to imagine a biker having a conversation with your grandmother being taken to task about his pie crust. Yeah. It's, it's the most hysterical thing to have seen. But anyways, view raw files as pie crust, OK? Um, if I can, if I have time, I'll show you what multiplication artifacting looks like. I, I, after class, we'll go outside if I can't, and I'll show you what it looks like. But basically, you want to touch that file as little as possible and get into a more powerful piece of software other than a raw processor with a UI bolted on top of it. OK? So I go to Photoshop because it allows me less artifacting in the controls that I have. And non-destructive just means there's a pathway back to the beginning. Because if you, if you clip a curve, right, and you're working non-destructively, did you do something destructive? Yeah. But we have this thing in our head, oh, it's non-destructive. No, no, it's destructive. It's just you have a pathway to undo whatever mess you made. This is the way you used to be able to do it. You had to buy this fancy get bellows. You had to get that lens, and you needed this gadget. Okay, this was not cheap. Okay, and then this is now. So what you get for film, for slides, the gadget that fits in front of the lens, you can control, adjust it like this. The secret here is to make sure that you loosen this little dealy bob, otherwise you'll scratch. And you have a series of extenders. It will work on the 40 millimeter for DX. It will work on the 60 millimeter nano uh, for full frame. And then the old 60 millimeter as well, they give you an attachment. I would, however, recommend the 60 millimeter micro Nikkor with nano coating because you're working on a D850, which means that it's past 24 megapixels. Anything past 24 megapixels, which is what standard glass can resolve to, requires nano coating. Nano coating was developed by Nikon for its laser etching system. They were the first people to invent it. I've heard some other lens people claim that it was invented last year. It was invented in the early, uh, ni late 90s, early 2000s. And what Nano coating does is it replicates the way a moth's eye looks at things and it causes no diffraction, diffraction and deflection of light. That makes it so that you can go down to a smaller sensor site. Standard glass can only do 24 megapixels. If you're going past 24 megapixels, the lens needs to be nano coated. That's why they were developed that way. So you're working on a 45.7 megapixel camera and you want to make an exact copy of your film, which does not have near the resolution that this has. I actually can show you, because I shot um, a picture using a nano-coated lens on film and then shot using the same lens digitally. So let me show you that. So this is film using a nano-coated lens. And that is what we used to say was sharp. Same lens, shot digitally. That's sharp. OK, and the reason why that's sharp is you have 14 and a half stops of dynamic range, and you have the equivalent of shooting a 44 by 36 inch print out of the camera. OK? So the reason why you want to shoot digital versus film is because you can do that with this form factor. But to be able to do that with this form factor, form factor first day with the new mouth, Form factor is you need nano coated lenses to do it. That's really what I want the take home to be, okay? But that doesn't change the fact that I have four million negatives that are costing me $200 a month, and I guess apparently knowing that I have them is good enough. I want to be able to get to that part of my archive. And so the way that you do this is you use this gadget. Now, there's a trick to how you set it up. First, don't drop the negatives on the floor. Just the way I roll. 
But what you need to do is you have to make sure that everything in the system is clean. So let me show you quickly how to properly clean a negative. I use the Hoodman Lens Cleanse system. It's a wet and dry system, and it's a two-part system. Most people, when they clean a lens, they go like this, right? How you clean a lens is you go in a circle, and then you bring everything to the edge, and then you wipe off the edge, OK? And the most important element in this whole operation is the back element. Because you'll focus, the light will focus through the front element if there's something on it to some degree. But if, the, if it's on the back element, it's going to block whatever's coming through. So that flaw will be on every negative that you shoot and every positive that you shoot. Now, how you check to make sure you don't have any schmutz on the lens, schmutz being a photographic term. See how I'm putting this on an angle? And you watch the condensation dissipate. And as it dissipates, we'll tell you whether or not there's anything on this lens, which there isn't. And then you do the same to the front. And since this is, I've already done this and it's sealed, I'm not going to do that. OK. The reason why this is just like this is so that you can even it out. And if you're using slides, If you notice, they have cardboard on them, or metal, or whatever it is that you choose to do. This allows you to pull in or pull out to fill the full frame. And the same with the negative carrier. Now, I don't care how well you treat a negative. Negatives attract everything except the opposite sex. So to clean a negative, what I do is you buy a pair of gloves, and you can buy a pack of 50. And you're going to need PEC-12 solution, PEC pad, a static cloth, and a static brush. And I had to buy a new bottle of PEC-12 solution because I didn't realize I couldn't bring this on the airplane. And that got the, sir, please step over here, sir. We need to check everything. <laughs> but it's under four ounces, sir. Oh, it's flammable. Condensed air doesn't do anything other than blow dirt around. And I use condensed air, but again, I can't bring that here either. So what I want to do is I want to get everything off like that. And then what I use next is the static cloth. Get back here. And usually I have this all out. And then with the anti-static cloth, note that I can handle this and not get any oil on it because I have a glove. And then with the static brush, usually what I do before and after is brush it to make sure that I have everything. So what I have is as clean as I'm going to get negative. No matter how much I clean, no matter how much air, no matter how much static, no matter how much fluids I have, I'm going to have something on there. But the fact is I'm going to have a minimal amount. Now what you do here is you put this in here. And boom. Again, because I have a glove, see how I can move this? I now have everything that I need right here to work with. So the big question is, what side faces the camera? Sorry. What side faces the camera? The emulsion side. Why? 
you're shooting through the, the shooting through the base, the cellulose base, but the other reason is what was facing the lens when you shot the picture, the emulsion side. So what's going to be the sharpest and have the greatest detail and have the less distortion? The emulsion side. What that means and why that is important and why you want to write this down is you're going to need to, in post-processing software, flip the negative or flip the chrome because it will be backwards. Okay? Because when you look at it this way, it's right side up, right? The light's coming through here, looking at it that way. When you're looking at it this way, it will be backwards. So the emulsion side faces the camera. You get this in here. And again, I'm going to do this in an overview. I show this on the video that I'm going to have put up. It will be up Wednesday. OK? And what I would do here. I'm in live view, OK? And apparently live view video, OK. OK. So I have live view on and focus peaking. And what I'm going to do here, you see this back here? is I can adjust it. See how I can adjust? And then once I get this set right, I can move it in or pull it out and get it so that everything is exactly where I want it to be. Now, the nice thing about doing it this way is once you get this set up, you become a machine. Because once this part of the tweak is taken care of, then everything is, is down here. Kill. Now, what do you see there? You see this as a negative, correct? Now, there's a negative mode in here, and it will make it a JPEG. But what, but what you want, but wait, there's more. What you want is you want to be able to see it as a positive. It makes life easier, right? This brings in something called picture control. And again, in the video that you can watch, I'll show you how to load a picture control utility that you make on the computer into your camera. So what I should be able to do in the best of all worlds, is you see these here where it says invert? I'm going to select that. And when I look at my picture control, what happens is it becomes a positive. OK? So that I can now see what's going on in the camera. And I've set a meta tag that says, do this. You can come up with all of your own specially created picture controls that become your signature style in picture control utility if you use Capture NXD to open up your raw file and move on. Now, you can make your own picture controls. And to do this, it's really straightforward. All I have to do is click the picture, and it takes it. And then we're done. That means that I now have it on my flash, my flash card, on my XQD card, and I can transfer it over to the computer. Was that difficult? What do I do about lighting? Glad you asked, sir. I use a loom cube. Or in my studio, I have um, a milk glass window, specifically for doing, some, doing portrait lighting. I'll, use, I'll shoot right into the melt glass window in the back and then um, shoot. You need to have a, diff, a, a diffuse, not a directional light source. You can, use, you can hook a strobe up so you, you can fire into it. There's all sorts of ways you can do it. Yep. So it's all set up to go, and boom, I'm good to go. And this is D50, so it's daylight. And then all I do is just shoot. And once that's set up, it just is literally click, move, click, move, and I'm done. And the same holds true for slides. And all you do is put the chrome in here, emulsion side facing front, take the picture, and know that you're going to have to flip the things that you need because 
the emulsion side would be backwards. Uh, it'll be sideways or right, sideways, but it won't be upside down. Okay, because um, changing this and going like this, you could do that, but it's just easier to do it in software. I use this as a light source, and what it is is watch this. So I can, well, I can get this thing really bright. So this is 80 bucks. It's a Lume cube, L-U-M-E cube. And you put it, where do you put it? Do you want it in front of it or on the side? Or in front. In front, okay. Okay, but any non-direct light source, you could use that light because it's diffused, right? You don't want like a light bulb. Okay, you can use a strobe. You can hook up with the attachment up here and the strobe will fire in there. So if that's what you want to do, you just need a controlled light source. This is D50, which is daylight, which means to my custom white balance guy, if I use a D50 light source, what am I gonna get? Daylight. Okay, so with that, I now have not only a cool camera to take pictures with, I now have a very cool scanner and by making a picture control and inverting the negative, I now have negatives that are raw files, which means that if I want to, I can do all sorts of other things with it. So let's take a look at. Um, I put on highlight warning, and I make sure that I don't blow out any highlights. And then once I've got that, good to go, right? All right, so. I need you to take a picture of this. Okay, so everybody take a picture of that. Picture control utility. Okay, what do you see here? I have a negative, right? And when I click on that, what do I have? A positive, okay? So I have a negative and a positive. And what I want you to see is watch right here. This is all you have to do if you want to make your own. You see how the curve line goes like this? Okay, if I take this curve line, and invert the curve, what do I get? A negative. And that's really, I was looking at that going, what happens? Now I have a raw file. And all I've done is I've created the presets. And what you do here, and the uh, video will show them to you, is you can download them here. You put them in your camera. There's a setting for upload picture control. OK? You have to load them into picture control so that it will load it into Capture NX. That's the pathway. The thing to keep in mind is this absolutely, utterly, completely, unequivocally, there is no change in this statement has to be done using Capture NXD. No third party um, raw processor works with Capture NXD. That's the choice of the third party raw processor to not do that. So you can't use these settings because it will only see what you captured, not what it is that you've said it to do. And what happens with a raw file is that a raw file gets an instruction set and it tells the raw processing software how to bake the cake. And that's what happens. Yes, you have infinite, not infinite, but you have a lot of possibilities in a raw file. All of that is based off of what all the systems that are talking to each other say. So you're asking me what quality do I find a 45.5 megapixel capture system with a 14.2 stop dynamic range with a noise capability of 25,600 ISO? As compared to Costco? Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, this is the best possible way you can get. You, this is the best you're going to get. What I have found is the best you're going to get and the best that can be shot with a digital camera, they're an extreme difference. I, the negative, that's as sharp as sharp can get on a color slide film. And compared to that digital capture, you tell me. Right? If the device that can produce an image as sharp digitally as that is capturing film, what is it that I'm going to get? Okay, 
film only contains 24.5 megapixels worth of resolution because that's what the lens was capable of delivering to the film because it was shot with if it's standard glass. Even using nano-coated lenses, and do keep in mind, this is one important fact I think that sometimes gets lost. Nikon is a lens company that makes cameras. And the way they design their cameras is they design their cameras to try and optimize for the quality of and characteristics of the lens. So they're always improving the cameras because the lenses are of such extreme quality. That said, I'm shooting it with the best Nikon's got glass-wise, and you can see the two lenses, the 105 f1.4, and the difference in quality. There is no film scanner that's going to do better, and in my humble opinion, including, so let's take a look at this image here. This is shot using the same lens, but this is digital versus film. OK? The other thing I want you to know is, what, do you, what color do you see here? Magenta. That has to do with the, the dye layers of the film causing that, okay, which you don't have that problem of color shift like you do in film. So that's as sharp as film, as, as chrome can resolve at 35 millimeter. So my answer is, that's the best you're going to get because you've got a device that's so blows past its resolution and its dynamic range. Film, on its very best day, has seven and a half stops of dynamic range. Okay, human vision is 22 stops of dynamic range. It moves up 100 stop dynamic range range. The camera is at 14.5 stops of dynamic range, almost double the, res the dynamic range of the film that it's recording. Almost double the resolution of film. So what, what do you think? It's going to do a better job. And you already own the camera, right? Right? <laughs> oh, OK, OK. As long as the camera's in your possession, but the bank owns it. I can live with that, sir. I can live with that. OK. So I think this is one of those you know, unsung pieces of tech that they made that's reasonably priced that all of a sudden makes this like, you got to be kidding me. This is cool. OK. Now, how many people use Nick software? How many people are concerned about Nick software? Don't worry. That's all I'm going to say. OK, well, let's look at this then. So it's a, it's a comparable file size? But let's find out, shall we? I'm now converting this into a negative. I've now made, saved it as a TIFF. Come here. Let's open this bad boy up in Photoshop. Ben, so are you shooting large raw or are you shooting medium? Because that's like 25 megapixels. I only shoot large. OK. So right now. I'm 260 megabytes out of the file, OK? And that's at 8-bit. That's not at 16-bit. At 16-bit, it'd be 520-something. So I already have way more film capability. The most that you can get out of, a fi out of film is 4,000 DPI resolution, OK? Um, this is capable of producing, if it had more information, it would give me more information. Now, how do you prove you can get more information out of a file? Uh, any of you heard of something called exposed to the right, which is not something you want to do with a negative, but the concept of ETTR, exposed to the right? That says that um, 2 thirds of the file's information exists in the first stop of capture. So underexposing to make it look right here is not the best idea. You don't walk around going, hey, does it look cool? Keep the camera. So I got 100 of them. You want to have more information. So the way I proved this was I shot an image a half stop hotter, so at n and then plus a half. I went from on an 810 
um, 48 megabyte raw file to 52 megabytes worth of data. So what do I know? I have more data. So what you're seeing is that that's all the data that's in there. I should be able to get, I could get more data if there's more data to be had. So the maximum amount of data to be had is what you're seeing here off of this image because there is no more. There's no more to squeeze out of this. Now, oh, that would explain this, wouldn't it? Let's get out of that. F. And remember, we, I flipped the file. You saw that? Now I have to rotate it. Let's flatten this bad boy. So now, what I have is a properly oriented image. So let's do a quick, and what you should see that there is a big difference between these two, okay? So if you were just looking at this, I'd be getting a lot of, if it matters most, believe it or not, with color management and calibration and high quality monitors, it matters the most when you're working on black and white. Okay, there are, we don't have a lot of memory colors. The memory colors that we have are skin tone and gray. Okay, is that gray? Is that grayer? Okay, and what you've got is you're seeing the base is putting the color. But if I'm trying to make decisions off of this versus this, now do you see how even this tonality is? You see how contrasty this is? So if I have a monitor that's this contrasty and not calibrated, I'm making decisions off of what? This monitor. So if I get it so that it looks right on this uncalibrated monitor that's all over the place, and I make a print, what you're going to get is the correction curves for this monitor, right? And I'm going to get a print that looks like crap. What do I blame? The printer. Because there's something called Versace's inverse square root law of technological blame. It's a famous law. And what that says is that which is the fault of technology, we blame ourselves. And that which is our fault, we blame technology. Just the way it is. OK? So if you have to put money anywhere in your workflow and you don't have an Adobe RGB monitor or a monitor calibrator, if, buy the calibrator first, get the monitor second. But calibrate your monitor. All right. Let's, how close to a wrap do I have to be? If I got five minutes, all right. Equal values of red, green, and blue make gray. What color is that? Watch what happens when I set it to the color blend mode. Bam, I now have black and white. With just a curve, in less than five minutes, I'm going to fix this image, or curves. So let's select multiply. Wow. One curve. Now, if I don't want to do any brush work at all, watch what I can do. OK. Let's select another curve. Let's select screen, which halves the density, multiply doubles the density. And let's select in our curve, get back here, give me my UI, let's select screen, and let's select strong contrast, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fill that with black, Select my brush tool, put it at 50%. And with two curves, what did I get? Look at that one, not that one. Simple, huh? That's how simple digitizing a negative is. That's how simple getting back to that can be. 
and all of a sudden, all of the film that's lost to you is now back to you. And it only costs under 200 bucks for the gadget. How much? 140. Okay, sub 200, 140 bucks. But what, really, what you really need is that lens, so whatever that lens is too, which is a good lens. You can't use the um, 105, 2.8 because of the focal distance. It has to be the 50 or the 60 millimeter. It was designed for this lens. What's the lens again? The 60 millimeter nano coated macro lens. And to answer the question, 6 0. Does it work with other cameras? Again, I say, there's something else other than Nikon? I, I don't know. It has to be a, it has to be the 60 millimeter micro Nikkor because you have to use the macro functionality. I'll be more than happy to answer questions out there. I've got to get out of here. Thank you very much.